Hello, it's me and the skeletons today. Um, I'm going to talk about this bone. So uh, this should be hilarious, humorous. Mm, anatomy jokes are um, limited and limiting. Right, um, while marking exam papers in the last year or so, um, I got this feeling that students spend a lot of time looking at this, that and the other and they're good, they're, they're pretty good with bones and the major bits, but that a number of students are lacking in their knowledge of some of the, you know, the lumpy bits of a bone. And this was probably most noticeable on the radius, probably just because we were asking questions about the radius or something like that. And I thought, okay, well, I can help people out by talking about the, the bits of the radius in a short video. Um, but then I realised that, well, the radius isn't on its own. It's got the ulna with it and it's got the, the humerus uh, proximal to it. And, you know, where do I start? I thought, really, I should start with the humerus. So in this video, I'm just going to talk about the humerus. And then in the future, I'll lead on to the radius and the ulna, because these things all articulate together. But I want to turn it down. We're not going to go into massive detail. We're not going to go into a whole load of fractures and stuff like that. I'm just going to point out some of the lumpy bits on this bone, which are significant, which you probably already know about. Um, but which um, there may be a couple there that you're not so clear on. So I'll, I'll try and clear that up for you. And remember that all of our plastic models, all of our skeletons are not the same. So I've got different skeletons for showing different things. And I know that on models I often struggle to find bony things. And I've got some real bones. Maybe I'll dig out a, hum dig out a humerus. Both left, quite different lengths, aren't they? Plastic, human. So what we'll do is we'll start at the top and we'll work our way to the, down to the bottom. So we'll start proximally and we'll work our way distally. And I'm just gonna highlight the bumpy bits, a little mention of what attaches to them and that sort of thing, okay? And remember that being the humerus, it's, it, has a, it works with the shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder region, the glenohumeral joint up here. It's part of that. Um, and also then at the other end, of course, it's got the, the elbow joint, hasn't it? All right, so what can we see? This is a left humerus, okay? A bit long for me as well, isn't it, I think? Um, and up here, we've got the head of the humerus. There's the, you know, the ball of that ball and socket joint. And look, you can see a couple of lumps here, right? So these are the tubercles. And we've got two tubercles. So we call one the greater tubercle and one the lesser tubercle. Which one do you think is bigger? Which one do you think is the greater tubercle? But the lateral one, this one out here, is the greater tubercle. And the medial one here is the lesser tubercle. So the greater tubercle out here, um, supraspinatus and infraspinatus, remember those rotator cuff muscles, those come over and attach here. And teres minor attaches here as well um, at different levels. Remember this sits thing, S-I-T-S. Anyway, that's rotator cuff. Go look at the rotator cuff video. But supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor attach onto the greater tubercle, which is lateral. And uh, the lesser tubercle here, uh, this is where uh, subscapularis comes in and inserts. So essentially, when you've got a bone, you've got tendons attaching to that bone and ligaments as well. And to get a really good attachment site, well, you grow a bit of bone, don't you? You grow a bit of bone into the tendon, you get that nice, strong junction. So that's what lumpy bits on bones are. They're where things attach to the bone usually. And sometimes the bone changes shape for strength and all that sort of stuff, right? But those are the two tubercles. Remember that the, the head of the humerus here is articulating with the glenoid fossa or the glenoid cavity of the scapula, right? So then it's those, those rotator cuff muscles that are up here that are attaching to these tubercles. Greater tubercle and lesser tubercle. Oh, look at that lovely groove in between the two tubercles. Isn't that nice? Isn't that just a, isn't that a thing, you know? Isn't that a, isn't that a great shape? Um, so we call that the inter 
tubercular groove or the intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital groove if you like. Um, so what runs through there? The long head or the tendon of the long head of biceps brachii runs up there as it's, as it's going up to insert her. So it protects that tendon and holds it in place. Oh, very lovely, isn't it? Very nice. Oh, nice. Good. Yes. Um, so that's really it for the top part there. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that we talk about an anatomical neck of the humerus and the surgical neck of the humerus. Now, the anatomical neck, if this is the head here, the anatomical neck is actually around here, right? So the anatomical neck is, is proximal to, is superior to the tubercles. It's around here. Um, now, if we look at our skeletons, so this is what I mean about not all skeletons are created equal. I mean, this is, this is one of our expensive skeletons. Have the arms been swapped around? Because, oh no, you can see there's the groove and there's the tubercles. Um, but there's not much of an anatomical, there's not much of a marking there for the anatomical neck. And look, if we look at this real bone, you can, you can kind of see an edge here, right, around the head. But me, there's a bit of a groove there. But back to the plastic bone, what I'm talking about is that, um, so the, you know how a synovial joint has got a cap capsule around it, right? Because the synovial joint's filled with synovial fluid and the capsule is doing a whole lot of cool stuff, but essentially it's holding all the, the fluid and everything in place. And that's got to attach to the bone to make a seal. Um, and what we often see is around here, so between the head and the tubercles, there's the tubercles there, we see kind of a bit of a groove, sometimes you see a bit of a, a remnant, a bit of a, an indication of the attachment of that, of that synovial capsule. And that, that marks the anatomical neck. Do you see? So the anatomical neck is between the tubercles and the head and runs around here. Now the surgical neck gets talked about as well, and the surgical neck is around here. So the surgical neck is more distal, it's inferior to the tubercles. The surgical neck is interesting because that's where this bone is most likely to fracture up here. Not at the anatomical neck, but at the surgical neck. All right, so anatomical neck of the humerus, surgical neck of the humerus. And as we go down here, we've got, there's our groove there. Now, one other thing we know about the humerus is that we've got a whole bunch of muscles anterior, you've got a whole bunch of interesting nerves, right? You've got the, the brachial artery and the brachial plexus and all sorts of cool stuff. Now, you've got, from the brachial plexus, you've got the radial nerve wending its way around posteriorly. And it, when it does that, it, it, it kind of spins around, it rotates, right? Um, it spirals around the radial nerve and the deep artery, the deep brachial artery goes around with it because they're both getting into the posterior compartment of the brachium of the, uh, the upper limb here because they want to innovate the uh, triceps muscle and send blood to it and stuff. So what you can often see is, is um, a radial groove. Now I find this very, very hard to find on bones. You can, you can kind of... You can kind of feel it, but is that imagination? Or is it really there? Um, so because of its spiraling nature, this gets called the spiral groove, or the radial groove, or the radial sulcus. Um, but it comes around here. Can you, you can kind of, you can kind of get a sense of, because we've got these ridges here, and you know, um, if I look at this bone here, can you see how, you see how we've got a bit of, bit of spiralling going on there. Can you see how, look, 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 there's definitely a bit of spiralling going on there, right? You see that? The shadow. Yeah, you can see that, right? You can see that. You see this ridge here coming around here, right? Kind of got a ridge there. And this is a real bone, not a plastic bone, right? So that, that ridge there, that's, that's, the, that's it. The spiral groove, that's the radial nerve coming around posteriorly. Very difficult to see. Okay, so as we're descending, this is lateral, right? This is, so this is out here. You can see there's a bit of a tuberosity out here, right? All right, so see where we are. This is, there's a little bit of a tuberosity, a little bit of a lump here. That's the deltoid tuberosity. Guess which muscle 
insert there. It's the deltoid muscle, right? So your deltoid muscle here, that inserts in there. And yeah, yeah. So deltoid tuberosity. So we've got the tubercles, intertubercular sulcus. Anyway, so deltoid tubercle here. Now we're almost there. Look, we're running down the diaphysis. We're running down the shaft of the bone. And can you see how it starts to flare out at the bottom? So we're looking posteriorly there, anteriorly there. So it starts to flare out. We've got to make a hinge joint, right? We're trying to make this bone that's light and strong and withstands forces and moves and does everything it's supposed to do. So it's, it's developed this sort of shape. But it's flaring out down here to make a hinge joint with the radius and the ulna. And as it flares out, we're forming these two epicondyles. Um, so why are they called epicondyles? Well, this articulating surface here is the condyle, right? So these are upon the condyles, or these are near the condyles, these are the epicondyles. So we have the lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle. And these, where it's flaring here, we've got these ridges, and these are simply called the epicondylar ridges. Don't get talked about much, aren't terribly interesting, but there you go, they're easy to remember, right? Epicondylar ridges. Now, If this is the lateral epicondyle and this is the medial epicondyle, the medial epicondyle is interesting because, of course, the ulnar nerve is going to curl around posterior to the medial epicondyle, so the medial epicondyle protects it. But of course, when you go and bang your medial epicondyle, you bang your ulnar nerve and you get tingling all the way up your arm. Then he's like, oh, bang me funny bone. So we assume that funny bone comes from humerus. Humerus, humerus, humerus without an O. The humerus bone, humerus with an O, it's funny, funny bone. <laughs> Obviously, but I had to mention it, right? Anyway, so from the medial epicondyle, right now, the medial epicondyle, which you can palpate out here, nice and bony and what have you, so the ulnar nerves under there, if you give it a palpate, you can feel it's got very nice. Um, but from the medial epicondyle, this is where many of the muscles of the anterior compartment of the forearm come from, or the flexor compartment. The two carpi muscles, so flexor carpi uh, radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris, both come from here. Um, flexor digitorum superficialis comes from here. Pronator teres, pronation, right, comes from here. Palmaris longus, if you've got one, will probably come from here as well. So this is a common attachment site for, all, for many of the muscles of the flexor compartment, right? Lateral, sorry, medial epicondyle, muscles of the flexor compartment. So if somebody gets pain here, then, and if it's associated with the tendons, we call it golfer's elbow. And it's usually from overuse, right? Um, golfers, they, you know, they, pronate with a lot of effort. So they often overuse these muscles, develop a bit of tendonitis and get pain here. So medial epicondyle, golfer's elbow. Okay, um, so there's the medial epicondyle. The lateral epicondyle then is on the other side and handily, many of the muscles of the extensor compartment of the forearm come from the lateral epicondyle. Extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, uh, extensor digitorum, uh, you've got anconius, oh, and you've got, of course, um, supinator, right? So supination, so supinator is attaching here as well. So if somebody gets pain here, we call that tennis elbow. Don't know much about tennis. Why is that then? Is that obviously your you're, you're supinating, so is that like a backhand thing, is it? But that's handy, isn't it? So we know then, we can remember then, if, we, if we've got the medial epicondyle and the lateral epicondyle, we think, oh, medial epicondyle, muscles of the flex compartment, lateral epicondyle, muscles of the extensor compartment. Isn't that useful to remember? Because um, there's a lot of stuff to remember in here. So that's, those are the epicondyles. So there's got one last thing to do, which is the condyle, which is unfortunately made up of lots of different bits. So this is the condyle here, the articulating surface, but it's got to articulate with both the radius and the ulna. Now you can remember which is on which side, 
because if you take the anatomical position, you'll always remember that your radial pulse is up here, right? So if that's your radial pulse, then this is the radius, and this is the ulna. So then you can always remember then that we have the head of the radius articulating here, and we have the, uh, the ulna here. Now I'll talk more about that when we talk about the ulna, when we talk about, about the radius. But we've also got a couple of dips. We can see that here. We've, in fact, we've got a hole in this bone. We've got a couple of, of dips in there, right? So those dips are going to accommodate um, bits of the radius and the ulna when you fully flex your elbow joint, right? Because um, they've got sticky outy bits. Look, so you can see that here. Look, we've got the head of the radius here. We've got all these bits here. So as you flex the elbow, they get accommodated. That's what those grooves are for. All right, can you see? If, so if this is lateral and this is medial, and you've remembered then that the radius is here and the ulna is here, then this little depression here is just called the, the radial fossa. Uh, whereas this depression here is called the, the coronoid fossa. So that's gonna take the coronoid process of the ulna when the ulna hinges with it, right? So those are on the anterior side, and then flip it around and posteriorly, we've got this large groove here, and this is for the olecranon. So this is the olecranon fossa. Olecranon, bony bit of the, uh, of the ulna. So that's gonna take the, the olecranon on full extension, right? So that's just the olecranon fossa there. Um, so then we've got the condyle, the parts of the condyle. So, I mean, this is a bit hard to remember. We've got the trochlea, meaning pulley, and the capitulum, meaning little head. Oh, maybe that makes it easier to remember because we're thinking about the head of the radius, right? So if the radius is, is lateral here, then the head of the radius is gonna articulate with the capitulum, little head, the capitulum of the condyle of the humerus here. Whereas the trochlea, so this does look bigger, right? This looks more like a pulley like you sling a rope over it or something, right? It looks like a pulley. So that's why I guess they're called the trochlea. All right, so this is medially on the condyle, all right? Medially, this is the trochlea. And the trochlea is gonna articulate with the ulna. And when we look at the ulna, we'll add all that up and that'll make a bit more sense, right? So trochlea, capitulum, condyle. And that's it, that's your lot. So there you go. Those are the bony parts of the humerus. Not entirely sure these two chuckle heads were a massive amount of use in this. But that's what I mean by the bony bits of a bone. I know there are a lot of bones in the body, but some are more important than others, some are bigger and what have you, you know. And you don't have to know all the bony bits of all the bones in the body, but I think a significant bone like the humerus or the femur or the radius and the ulna and what have you, it's not too hard, right? So we've got the head, the anatomical neck and the surgical neck, greater and lesser tubercles, the intertubercular sulcus, that deltoid tuberosity, we had that 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 radial or spiral groove back here and then we had the epicondyles lateral and medial muscles attaching to those and then we've got those little hollows right and then we've got the the condyle itself and the two parts of the condyle it just adds to your language adds to your your understanding so if somebody says somebody's got a fracture of this that or the other you don't just go yeah i totally know what you're talking about You'll have heard the words before and hopefully that'll dredge it up and you'll think, oh, that was on the thing. And you'll, you know, you'll have an idea of what everybody else is talking about, all right? So those are the bony parts of the humerus. In the future, the near future, we'll look at the bony parts of the ulna and the bony, bony parts of the radius. Okay, cool, right, until next time. Take it easy, but not too easy. Even the right arm for that. Obviously the left arm, but is that the correct arm?